Hello and welcome to I Know Dino. I'm Garrett. And I'm Sabrina. And today in our 446th episode, we have an interview with Darren Nash, the consultant and paleontologist for Prehistoric Planet 2. And along with that theme, we've got the episode four discussion, which is about oceans. Yep. But it's fitting that we have an interview this episode because there's not as much dinosaur stuff to talk about when it comes to oceans, but there is some really cool stuff. Oh, yeah. They have a whole bunch of ammonites. Yeah. And we also have dinosaur of the day, Baptornis, which is a Hesperornis relative, right? Yes. And then I've got a fun fact, which is all about the different types of webbing that you can find on dinosaur feet. And we could probably <laughs> find a non-avian dinosaur feet. It was a really fun rabbit hole or a Rictodromius burrow, I should say. And I've got some guesses about like what type of webbing Spinosaurus might have had, which is also fun to think about. But before we get into all of that, we want to thank some of our patrons. And this week we have four new patrons to thank. And they are Tom, Abigail, Sydney, and Nikki, thank you all very much for joining. Yes, thank you. And we also want to thank Bill Jago, Ermel, Robert, James Pasco, Velociraptor, and John for their continued support of our show. Yeah, thank you all for being Dino It Alls. And thank you to all of our listeners and our community, because we say this every week, but you support our show. So without further ado, jumping into the dinosaur era animals in oceans really rolls off the tongue huh it does <laughs> i was thinking we'd say dinosaur era animals because this episode of prehistoric planet 2 it's more about mosasaurs and ammonites and plesiosaurs than it is about dinosaurs but there are scenes with hesperonis and pyroraptor which we'll get into it makes sense because the episode is titled oceans mm -hmm. yeah, and it's prehistoric planet not dinosaur planet yes that's a different show it's dinosaur heavy. <laughs> yeah. yeah. <laughs> There's five areas for this episode that they cover. The La Bouchard locality in what is now France, the Western Interior Seaway in the U.S., the Lopez de Bertodano Formation, the Hakubuchi Formation, and the Tethys Sea. So if you've been listening to our mini-series here, then you'll know that we're going to talk about these localities a little bit. I'll start with the La Bouchard locality in what is now France, and that's where Pyroraptor was first found. There's other animals that have been found that includes a nodosaur, rhabdodon, abelosaurids, titanosaurs, and turtles. Not too much I could find about that particular locality, so we'll just keep moving on. <laughs> Sounds like a swamp. You've got turtles and dinosaurs <laughs> mixed together. <laughs> Swampy France. Then Western Interior Seaway is the next one. We're going to talk about that is a very popular place to discuss. Mm -hmm. And it was around for about 30 million years, or I should say up to 30 million years. The current estimate is between 66 and 96 million years ago. It was around so pretty much all of the late Cretaceous, except for the first couple million years. Although it might not have been there that whole time, there might have been periods where it receded, or, you know, like hot periods or whatever was going on, cold periods. <laughs> <laughs> you know, we were talking the other day about what affects sea level rise. There's so much stuff that can happen over the span of millions of years with humidity increases or ocean spreading, all sorts of stuff like that. So it may not have always been there in the middle of North America, but at its largest, it connected the Caribbean Sea to the Arctic Ocean by cutting straight through North America which just seems insane because the Caribbean Sea is not anywhere near the Arctic Ocean. <laughs> yeah. It's literally thousands of miles of continent and pretty high elevation continent these days. So it's no small feat to cover that whole area with water. Basically, if you draw a line from Louisiana and the eastern part of Texas, northwest through Kansas, the Dakotas, Montana, Alberta, and Saskatchewan, that's where it was. <laughs> it's a large area. <laughs> it is. And if you want to see where it is, when I was confirming this, what I did is I went to the Paleo Bio database and I put in Hesperornis and Elasmosaurs. Mm -hmm. And you'll just see them peppered all through the middle of North America because those were pretty common animals in the Western Interior Seaway. It also leads to really funny things like how the Mosasaur Tylosaurus is the state fossil of Kansas despite Kansas being 
about 700 miles from Lake Michigan or the Gulf of Mexico or really any other large body of water. <laughs> yeah, but back in the day, Tylosaurus was around. Yeah, Kansas was essentially completely underwater in the middle of the ocean, which is just so weird to think about. At its deepest, the Western Interior Seaway reached about half a mile deep, and it was about 600 miles or 1,000 kilometers wide at its widest. <laughs> it would have been a really weird environment because that's actually not that deep for an ocean, and most of it was a lot shallower than that. So with all the runoff coming off of North America from Laramidia to the west and Appalachia to the east, it probably would have been less salty and also full of silt from all that runoff. So it would have been sort of like a river delta, at least in some places. And it just kind of would have been an unusual place. It might have been pretty murky a lot of the time. It's kind of hard to imagine yeah. <laughs> what it would be like, really. But it's a really interesting place. It was full of animals. Mm -hmm. Big animals with sharp teeth. Yes. And smaller animals. With sharp teeth. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Then there's the Lopez de Bertodano Formation that's in the Antarctic Peninsula. There's one estimate of temperatures that found at the intermediate and deep sea ocean temperatures. It was a mean average of 43 degrees Fahrenheit or 6 degrees Celsius. And it ranged from 39 to 54 degrees Fahrenheit or 4 to 12 degrees Celsius, which is cold for me. Yeah. Although that wouldn't really be cold enough for sea ice. So I saw something too where it was like there's disagreements about whether or not there would be sea ice there. Mm. But in the prehistoric planet too, they did take the approach of icy. I think because it makes it more fun. There's more interesting stories you can tell if there's ice and that might be one of the most likely places to find ice where we have fossils from. Mm -hmm. There's also the Hagobuchi Formation that's in now what is Hokkaido, Japan. And it's known for a lot of invertebrates, mostly bivalves and ammonites. But there's also Mosasaurus, Phosphorosaurus, sea turtles, and the hadrosaur dinosaur, Camuisaurus, which is a saurolophene, so it doesn't have a crest. And it's estimated to be four or five tons. Yeah, that was a big one. Mm -hmm. That's sort of like a Montasaurus level almost, if I remember right. Yeah. And then last, there's the Tethys Sea. We've talked about that. A little bit on our show, it, it was a prehistoric ocean. It was in the Mesozoic and in the early Cenozoic, which is our current era, so it lasted a long time. It was named after Tethys, a sea goddess in ancient Greek mythology. And in the late Cretaceous, when Gondwana was breaking up, it pushed what's now Africa and India north across the Tethys and opened up the Indian Ocean. And it was home to a whole bunch of ammonites, which we'll talk a bit about later ammonites are really cool yeah i think all of the european archipelago stuff was basically considered part of the tethys sea too so sort of that whole europe and indian ocean sort of area yeah so for the filming locations we'll talk about where they went for episode four and the animals associated with them According to the press notes, this episode was, quote, voted the unluckiest episode to shoot. Because <laughs> <laughs> you're just filming, like, boring ocean with nothing in it? Not at all. It's underwater shoots. They're affected by the weather and the surface, as well as the underwater currents and the sea swell. So you've got a lot of challenges. <laughs> oh, I see. You want, like, clear water? I, I don't think there was anything boring about <laughs> any of this. They said... Quote, every shoot experienced some form of freak weather event. Hurricane Ida in Grand Cayman, a Medicaid storm in the Balearics and in Sweden where the team needed to film sea ice temperatures went from negative 27 degrees Celsius to 12 degrees Celsius in under a week, which meant all our ice melted. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that sounds problematic. Yes. So maybe not boring, but very frustrating. Yeah. <laughs> and it, it's also hard to film in real underwater landscapes because LIDAR apparently doesn't work underwater. So they ended up using an underwater drone with several cameras. Okay, and they must have used LIDAR to figure out the mapping for their CGI, I assume. Yeah, I'm not totally sure. Now the episode starts with Phosphorosaurus in a reef. It's hiding in reefs from bigger animals and bigger mosasaurs, but it is also a predator, so it hunts when the sun sets. 
because that's when it's safer and also when lanternfish and other smaller animals swim around the surface. According to Prehistoric Planet, Phosphorosaurus has the largest eyes of Mosasaurs. It is itself a Mosasaur, so it's got good night vision. Proportionally the largest. Yes. <laughs> Not by absolute size. Yeah, good point. Yeah, there are a lot of animals that do that kind of thing. Hang out in reefs and then wait for the sun to go down so they can get around without getting gobbled up. Mm -hmm. They do the gobbling instead. Mm -hmm. To film the scene, they went to Grand Cayman, which is the largest of the Cayman Islands, and it's a cruise ship port. It's known for its beaches. They also, uh, interestingly, went to the underwater studio, so they did do some filming. In a giant indoor swimming pool? Yes, and not everything was in real underwater landscapes. It's a film studio where Harry Potter, James Bond, and other films have been filmed. It, there's a pool that can hold around 150,000 gallons of water. According to producer Amber Eames, Quote, Mike Gunton set the bar extremely high for our prehistoric planet series two, and my first shoot for the Oceans episode was one of the hardest. It was an underwater story on a unique tiny mosasaur found in Mukawa in northern Japan. Phosphorosaurus had large eyes and a well-developed binocular vision, field of view 35 degrees, indicative of its predatory behavior. This was a night hunter. On set, we dived down to 20 meters below sea level to capture the truly diverse and distinctive underwater world found only in the Cayman Islands. To film it, we had one of the largest crews of the Prehistoric Planet series, with submarines working alongside and a super talented dive crew to capture the underwater world in a way never achieved previously. Despite the challenges, the toughest part of the shoot surprisingly wasn't the underwater elements at all. On the 27th of August, 2021, Hurricane Ida hit. It left us all hiding out on the ground floor of our accommodation without food or running water for several days. Fortunately, we all rode out the deadly hurricane safely, but the entire crew will never forget this shoot. Yeah. <laughs> a hurricane will do it. I wonder, it, it seems like being in a submarine during a hurricane is probably a pretty good place to be, but if you need to come back up, maybe not so much. Nah. It's probably not safe to go out in one. It's also interesting that you said that they were filming in August of 2021, mm -hmm. which was a year before the first season of Prehistoric Planet came out. That oh, good point. It sort of confirms point. that they were working on this even before. Maybe they are working on a series three. The way the people, when we asked them about season two, responded versus how they responded to season three was exactly the same, mm -hmm. which makes me think there is going to be a season three and they just can't confirm it. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> it could be. <laughs> well, I hope it's true. Me too. In the next scene, we see Hesperonis grabbing fish in the water. It's our first dinosaur. Yes. So, of course, we have to talk about that one. And it swims through schools of fish. It was a really interesting scene because you've got the fish and then you see Hesperonis obviously being a very good swimmer and successfully catching some of these fish. And then you've got this larger fish. Zephactinus that comes onto the scene. And at first it seems okay because it's just, it's got its huge mouth and it's scooping up fish. It seems happy. It can swallow prey half its size whole, apparently. Yeah, that ability to eat huge prey is based on a real fossil called the fish within a fish. <laughs> it's a 14 foot or 4.2 meter Zephactinus with a six foot three inch long fish of another genus, Gillicus, I think it's pronounced. And that fish is completely inside it. It's fossilized inside it. And I think its mouth is too small to swallow me whole, <laughs> but it might be able to swallow me in pieces. Mm. <laughs> Even though it swallowed the fish whole, it may have died as a result. One hypothesis is that the fish struggled inside it and tore open its esophagus or stomach or Ooh. something on the way down and then, yeah, ended up killing it. But there are at least two other examples of Zephactinus swallowing Gillicus whole. So I guess swallowing this other genus of fish as a whole thing at once was just... It's just what it did. Something it did regularly. You can see the fish within a fish at the Sternberg Museum of Natural History, which was a previous sponsor of the show. So I'd recommend that. Mm -hmm. And then as another little side fun fact, Zephactinus has also been found in the gut contents of a large shark called Cretoxyrhina, which was bigger than a great white shark. Ooh. Fish eat fish world. It is. Still is. <laughs> <laughs>
And Zephyrus also was cannibalistic, just to add to it. Yeah, I looked up or I tried to look up if that ever was seen, if there mm-hmm. was a Zephyrus inside a Zephyrus. Couldn't find it, but I found all those Gillicus inside Zephyrus. So. <laughs> so knowing all this, maybe it's not so surprising that Zephyrus goes after Hesperornis, mm-hmm. even though it's catching its own fish. Yeah, it reminds me of an orca going after a penguin. It's sort of the same like huge thing going after like this poor little dinosaur. <laughs> I've never thought about a Hesperornis getting, you know, chased before. But yeah. yeah, it makes a lot of sense. And penguins get chased by predators too. Yeah. Yeah, I guess I'm just because when I'm thinking about the Mesozoic, a lot of times I'm not f- thinking about the non-dinosaurs in yeah. it. But the Hesperornis in the prehistoric planet is really fun to watch swim because it has its feet facing out, sort of like it's going into a ballet plie, you know, <laughs> you know, and then it like pushes their feet together simultaneously with a big kick, kind of like doing the breaststroke. Ah, uh, okay, yeah. Except with like more flexible hips, so you can get those feet really pointed, like soles of feet together. <laughs> Flap them together. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I also found, looking through my notes about the Western Interior Seaway, some notes about Hesperornis distribution because it's all up in the Western Interior Seaway. Mm -hmm. There was a presentation by Chapman et al. at SVP 2021, and they were talking about how Hesperornithiformes, meaning the group that includes Hesperornis and its relatives, lived in the Western Interior Seaway between 83 and 72 million years ago, and they ate cephalopods, crustaceans, and sometimes fish. They had a lot of similarities with cormorants and diving ducks. Hmm. And they ranged in size from 0.8 to 2 meters or 2.6 to 6.6 feet long. They got pretty big. Yeah. They've been found from Arkansas all the way up to the Canadian Arctic. So literally the entire stretch of the Western Interior Seaway. Mm -hmm. And most of them are marine, but there were some found in lakes and rivers in Wyoming and Montana. Which kind of makes sense because, you know, they didn't have gills, so they can (laughs) handle different water salinities. They also did some models to predict where Hesper Ornus would be. And the main thing that they found was when there were elasmosaurs around, you were less likely to find Hesper Ornus. Mm. So they were probably competing with each other. They probably wasn't like one was eating the other one, like Elasmosaurus was eating Hesperornis because it seemed like they were probably eating fish and crustaceans as well based on their gut contents. But they're eating the same fish and same crustaceans. Yeah, exactly. So they might have just had to separate Mm -hmm. so that they both had enough food to get, basically. They also found a bunch of Hesperornis babies in the Arctic, essentially, above 50 degrees latitude. So they might have preferred these high latitudes, especially for mating. Sort of like penguins. Yeah. They didn't specifically find any predators in their study, but they proposed that something like Tylosaurus, the large mosasaur, which is the state fossil of Kansas, and sharks might have been predators. Mm. Always got to watch out for sharks. Yeah. If it can eat a Zephactinus, which can eat a Hesperornis, then Hesperornis also needs to worry about the shark. And we'll get on to where they filmed the Western Interior Seaway after a quick sponsor break. To film the scenes with Hesperornis and Zephactinus, the crew went to Dunsborough, Western Australia. It's a coastal town, it's a popular tourist destination that's about three hours' drive from Perth, and it's known for its wineries, hiking trails, and beaches. Probably good surfing, too. Yes. And we did talk about Hesperornis back in episode 250 in our Bone Wars episode, if you want to go back and learn even more details about that dinosaur. I didn't remember it was a Bone Wars dinosaur. Yeah. I always think of it as like a more modern discovery for some reason. Yeah, we've known about it for ages. (laughs) Like 150 years. (laughs) Now moving on to the islands of prehistoric Europe. This is where we see the first ammonites. These are ammonite eggs that are in the tides. Oh yeah, they're so cute. They were so cute. They're a fraction of an inch in size and then they break free from their egg and they move by jet propulsion. And then the tide is getting low, which is dangerous for them. They got to get out. So they kind of work together to move as one so as not to get stuck and die from lack of water. Although the ones in the back of the pushing yeah, do they, get stuck. They don't make it. But that works out because then baby pyroraptor comes out and eats the stranded baby ammonites. Mm -hmm. (laughs) Those are even cuter. Yeah, they're fuzzy. 
Yeah, it's a pretty good claws going too. They didn't have much for wings, but they had pretty massive claws on their little fuzzy bodies. Yeah. And we talked about Pyroraptor in episode 390, if you want to go back and listen for more details. But it's a feathered raptor and it had a long, thin tail and was probably a cute baby. (laughs) (laughs) To film the scene, the crew went to Porto Santo Island, close to Madeira, Portugal. It's an island known as the Golden Island because of its long beach. The island is nearly seven miles or about 11 kilometers long and nearly four miles or about six kilometers wide. And the beach is roughly five and a half miles or nine kilometers long. There's a lot of beach. Yeah, so it sounds like it's mostly beach. (laughs) It's a good place for diving. Oh, and if you want the baby ammonite specifically, it's a Nostoceras. But we'll talk a little bit more about that because there's even more ammonites in this episode. But in the next scene, we go to the middle of the Pacific Ocean to an atoll. And that's where we see Tarangosaurus, which is an elasmosaur. And it leaves that area for deeper water to go for food. And then you've got Mosasaurus, which is an ambush predator. And it uses its large tail to accelerate and goes after the Tarangosaurus. It can strike with such force that the impact alone can kill it. Now, in prehistoric planet, Mosasaurus is about 50 feet long. That's about 15 meters. The team did a study and they found that Mosasaurus could probably clear 75% of its body length in one second. And in the bonus at the end of the episode, they talk about how if this Mosasaurus was 17 meters away from you, in one second, it's 75% closer. And the next second, it has gone past you and maybe eaten you (laughs) along the way. So there's a few things that may have made it so fast. Like crocodiles, it had muscles that could give it short bursts of a lot of power. And like fish, Mosasaurus could have had this C start where it bends its body into a C shape and then pushes itself and it can accelerate from standstill to full speed. Yeah, it's pretty crazy. Yeah, and they they go more into it in the bonus part of the episode if you watch that part. So for filming these scenes, they're again at Grand Cayman that cruise ship port, largest of the Cayman Islands, and the underwater studio. So they were able to do a few scenes from the same sets or landscapes. The next scene's in the seagrass beds off the coast of Europe. And now we've got ammonites in all shapes and sizes. I think they call this the ammonite city scene. Hmm. You've got Baculites, which is a six-foot-long ammonite. Diplomaceras, which is a... They describe it as a paperclip shape. <laughs> But it's similar in size to Baculites. Yeah, that one's a weird one. It's almost like a snail if it didn't connect to itself in the middle. So there's like a weird gap as it spirals out. But it is spiraling in like a weird paperclip shape. Yeah. And these ammonites, they eat plankton, small crustaceans, and fish. Which shouldn't be surprising. They're very big. Mm -hmm. The Nostoceros ammonite juveniles, they've made their way to this... Ammonite City, and they look like they're parachuting through water. Yeah. (laughs) And the adult Nostoceras are very coiled. Apparently, there's thousands of ammonite species, and ammonites had been around for 400 million years by this point in time in the late Cretaceous. Wow. And they were right about to go extinct. Yeah, we were talking, well, sort of talking on Twitter about how ammonites, it's amazing how long they lived. And then they went extinct. And we got a book recommendation I'll have to check out later. But one person was saying that apparently ammonites had their larvae swim in the plankton, which are ocean surface dwellers. And then what killed the dinosaurs also killed off the surface dwellers. So then the babies didn't have any food? Yeah, I think so. So I'll have to check out this source. Maybe it'll end up being a bonus episode. Mm -hmm. So to film this scene, the crew went to the Esfreas Marine Reserve in Ibiza and Formentera, Spain. This reserve was created in 1999 to protect ecosystems. It's about 13,600 marine hectares, or about 33,600 acres. And there's a lot of underwater landscapes, including the Posidonia Meadows, which is a UNESCO World Heritage Site. And Posidonia is a seagrass. It's known also as Neptune grass or Mediterranean tapered, and it forms large underwater meadows. Hmm. 
That sounds pretty. It is. It must have been pretty in the show, too, and I just didn't notice because I was paying attention to the Ammonites. Well, it's the the background (laughs) for the Ammonites. Yeah. (laughs) There are over 30,000 Ammonite species, and Ammonites have been found pretty much everywhere that there used to be oceans. It's helpful that they fossilize really well, since they're basically a giant skeleton, and they get buried in sediment that fossilizes them easily. Yeah. (laughs) Well, there's so many that they're index fossils. So if you see certain ammonites in a rock layer, that can tell you what time period that layer's from. It's my favorite thing about invertebrates. <laughs> they help you know how old vertebrates were. <laughs> <laughs> then last, we've got the scene in the frozen sea around the Antarctic. And we see Mortunaria, the plesiosaur. And it's got a thick layer of blubber. They describe it as secretive and elusive. And it migrates from South America to get to the Antarctic for spring. And then it goes there to eat polar mud that's full of small animals. Yeah, that was (laughs) so weird. And they were saying they didn't think anything else had ever evolved that sort of weird filter feeding strategy. Yeah. Which makes sense because it's so strange. It is kind of like how a baleen whale works, except without mud. Right. Yeah, it keeps its mouth partially closed and uses it to kind of filter out the mud. To film that scene... The crew went to three different places. I guess I could see that because you got underwater, you've got like the ice, little holes in the ice, and a third thing. <laughs> <laughs> yes. So they went to the Kronoren Nature Reserve in Sweden. That's a nature reserve created in 1975, and it has ice reefs and water-filled boulders. Ice reefs. Yeah. They also went to the Ormberget Hetzelandet Nature Reserve in Sweden, and that's a nature reserve that's about eight square miles or 21.6 square kilometers, and it has a lot of hiking trails. And they went to Breakwater Fort in Plymouth Sound in the UK. That's a concrete island slash fort that was built between 1860 and 1880. It was meant to defend Plymouth Sound, also known as the Sound, which is this deep inlet A sound is a smaller body of water that connects to a larger sea or ocean in the English Channel. The sound is in the English Channel. And they also have the Plymouth Breakwater there, which is a 1,710 yard or 1,560 meter stone breakwater to protect the sound. And it's a stone structure to protect against tides. It's freestanding and it's part of a large man-made reef that goes down almost 60 feet in some spots. So some interesting places to film for the plesiosaur eating mud. I do like the idea of ice reefs. Yeah, I don't get what that is. I'm not entirely sure either, but I think it involves ice and reefs. (laughs) Okay, thanks for (laughs) clarifying. (laughs) Anytime. And now on to our interview with Darren Nash. But of course, as always, we got going on all sorts of different dinosaur rabbit holes, Richtodromius burrows, Mm -hmm. and we couldn't fit it all the episode. But if you're a patron, then you can get access to it by going to your Patreon premium content feed or patreon.com slash inodino and listening to it there. I definitely recommend it because I think we were his last interview of the day and the producer who was setting up the call and listening at the end was like, wow, that was a really good conversation. You guys really got into a lot of different territory that the other interviews didn't get into. A little humble brag there. (laughs) (laughs) I think we might have gotten, we might have geeked out a little more on the dinosaurs. Yeah. Yeah. Because we're a dinosaur podcast and not like a general TV show magazine or something. But it was a really fun conversation. It was. We're joined this week by Darren Nash. He's a paleontologist, author, science communicator, and founder of Tetrapod Zoology, which includes a blog, podcast, and convention. But we're talking to him today because he's the scientific consultant and advisor for Prehistoric Planet. Thank you so much for joining us. Thanks for having me. Great to be here. So before we talk about the second season, I wanted to say... Thank you for putting Therizinosaurus and Dinochirus in the first season because they are delightful. (laughs) Yes. Yeah, fan favorites now. Yes. Did you have any say in which dinosaurs were featured? Yeah, I mean, I've been involved in, you know, every step of the process from, well, we always agree that we were going to be working on the latest late Cretaceous in the Maastrichtian and which animals are we going to have? Which animals are our stories going to be built around? 
And among the lists, we've got to have Dinocaris. We've got to have Therizinosaurus. If we can do it, then yes, let's do it. And we did. What a thrill. Yeah. Awesome. So one of the most noticeable features in the first season, before we get into the second season, I promise we'll get there, is that you had the balloons on Dreadnoughtus. And I noticed that Alamosaurus and Rapetosaurus didn't have them in the second season. Was there a reason why you chose to put those neck balloons on Dreadnoughtus and not the others? Well, those of us involved in building that particular story, we did want to push the idea that at least some dinosaurs would have, I mean, you know, part of my research has looked at uh, sexual selection theory as applied to dinosaurs. So it's like dinosaurs in general, non-bird dinosaurs, it goes for birds as well, but non-bird dinosaurs, they're very flamboyant animals, crests and frills and all these uh, remarkable structures, excellent color vision. I think a good argument can be made that they would be visually flamboyant animals. So one of the, with that in mind, how did the gigantic sauropods display? Well, the one possibility is that they could have had really remarkable display structures that we don't have represented in the fossil record. And the same way today that there are birds and other animals that have really strange and often, you know, disturbing, weird display structures like inflatable sacks. Classic example is a frigate bird. Gular sac, could you have this on sauropod dinosaurs? Now there's been this argument going on for a couple of years. Could the long necks of sauropod dinosaurs have had some role in visual display and sexual display, you know, during the mating season? And add all that together, we basically want to we wanted to play with this idea. Can we realistically pull off the idea that some sauropods might have had visually unusual display structures? So in the same way that if you think of an unusual display structure in a living animal, let's say, for example, the peacock's tail, that doesn't mean that all birds related to peacocks have that kind of tail. Of course, they don't. The others are all doing different things. So that's the example that we are sort of going with there. It's like maybe some sauropods have unusual display structures, but it doesn't mean that closely related ones did. So by no means, by putting those speculative sacks on Dreadnoughtus, by no means would you expect them to be present on like all titanosaurs or all close relatives. That's the thinking. Gotcha. I did really enjoy them. <laughs> yeah. And the little <laughs> sound effect that went with them. <laughs> I love the sound effects they make. Yeah. Yeah. And and we, the am amount of experimentation that we indulged in to get those sacks looking the way they did, you would not believe there was a lot. Of, well, maybe you would believe just a vast amount of R&D basically and trying to make them look right and weird, but not too weird. You know, there's <laughs> always this balancing act. Uh, that we indulge in. I, I find myself saying to the, the people doing the CG all the time, on the one hand, it's got to look like a living animal, but on the other hand, totally not. It's like, I, I know this is a, this contradiction we have to come up with. And I mean, I think we obviously succeeded because our animals are basically so convincing. They really, do, they look embedded in the landscape. They oh, look yeah. like real animals. Yeah. So the entire great. series, I was like, how is this all CGI? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And I remember reading somewhere that like certain aspects of it weren't CGI, but there are still some scenes where I'm like, I can't tell like the, in the first season where there's the Tyrannosaur trying to step on the crab. I'm like, is that a real crab? It's like, it can't be a real crab there, but it might be a real, I, I, I can't tell the difference. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And it's in our interest to keep that secret from you because there are many things that people have thought are CG and they're not. Mm -hmm. And there's other things that people have, think are real world and they're not. Yeah. It's basically impossible to, to spot. When, yeah. when it's there. Yeah. That's so cool. Are there any favorite dinosaurs that you have from the new season? From the new season? So I've just, just been asked this in another interview, and I remember coming up with a good answer for season one, because for season one, Therizinosaurus, I've, I've always been a big fan of Therizinosaurus, yeah. mm -hmm. and getting the big one itself, Therizinosaurus, in there is like, you know, that's, that's a win for me. For season two, I haven't yet thought of like a particular animal that for me is like, oh yeah, that's a favorite. Really, really like that one. So, I mean... I'm a huge fan of the Asdarkid pterosaurs. So sorry, non-dinosaurs. You know, having as as dark, it's like absolutely love getting those in there. Really, really like our our brightly coloured displaying male Hatsocotrix. Also in non-dinosaurs, the Crocodilomorph Simosuchus. I just mm -hmm. know that's mm -hmm. going to be a fan favourite. Yeah, and then among the dinosaurs, I think um, I really love the way so many of our dinosaurs look. And off the top of my head, from the, I think we've got 25 new animals relative to season one. Mm. And in that list, Improbator, the um, mm. Mm. Antarctic Paravian theropod, I just think it looks awesome. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Especially how it's introduced. 
with the thermal. <laughs> Excellent. Yeah, you've, I'm, I'm glad you've seen the sequence. So, yeah, yeah. Well, uh, not not a well known animal at all. Still, still very enigmatic. Only known from a, from a single foot, but um, our rendition of it, it just looks so cool. It's like that's for me. That's like one of the take home animals of of the series. Yeah, yeah it looks great. So, since you were talking about Ashdar kids, I know. So, I assume the idea of showing Hatsegopteryx being that apex predator was your idea. Were you really pleased with how it came across mm-hmm. as like this just menacing, you know, almost like a evil, I don't know, <laughs> terror of the skies? Well, they've been one of the standout groups of the entire season, haven't they, the Asdarkers? I, I, mean, I mean, we've all heard of these animals, but for the majority of the viewing public, it's like they had no, they have no concept that such a thing exists. There's, there's this vague awareness of pterodactyls but mm-hmm. the fact that there's these giraffe-sized kind of stork-billed predators, and yeah, again, you know, like the, deciding which animals we use is a is a sort of team decision, and we know we're going to have Quetzalcoatlus. At some point, we make the decision that we're going to have other Asdarkids were present globally in the Lake Cretaceous, so we're going to have them in other places. And can we get more diverse kinds? Yeah, let's let's include Hatsagopteryx if we're going to be showing an Eastern European story. We used Mark Witten as a, as a as a consultant, as well as myself. And of course, Mark and I have both published on this specific group of pterosaurs. So it's not a surprise that the vision of these animals that you see in Prehistoric Planet is the view of them that Mark and I have determined through through our research. And just to see them, I mean, yeah. again, for me, they're like utterly convincing in Prehistoric Planet. They were amazing. And I was thinking about the scene in the fifth episode where it's Quetzalcoatlus fighting t-rex and over the was it the alamosaurus and as i was watching it i was thinking like (laughs) these are all giants yeah (laughs) and also no way there's no way like you know like teenage or maybe eight-year-old kids arguing about which dinosaur would win in a fight nobody's arguing in favor of quetzalcoatlus over t-rex but then when you put it together it's like oh i guess it kind of makes sense it's like the crows getting rid of a big old hawk or something near the group tactic Yes, yeah, so this was kind of inspired by a paper that, that Mark and I published in 2015. Quite an academic argument, but so we propose that as dark kids are these terrestrial stalkers, they're moving around in terrestrial environments, picking up little dinosaurs and mammals and whatnot as their prey. And one of the arguments against that view, which comes from one researcher, is he said, that surely can't be true because there are these terrestrial predators like tyrannosaurs, tyrannosaurs that would just rip an as dark kid to pieces. It's like, oh, come on, that's not how the world works. <laughs> you can walk around on the African savannah today and you won't get ripped to shreds by a lion. I'm, I, you know, in the late Cretaceous world, you can be an animal and live a life. You don't get destroyed by a predator within a few minutes. And an animal like a giant as dark it is a formidable beast. It's like, it's really tall, as I've already said. It's kind of like, you know, seven, six, seven meters tall or, or, or so. It's got a two meter long pointed spear on its face. <laughs> And predators, presumably including even animals like tyrannosaurs, based on what we know about the world today, there are times when they would have been conservative, where they would have chosen not to take an unnecessary risk, just because like I don't want to get stabbed in the eye today. Mm -hmm. So, so if you have like T Rex versus Quetzalcoatlus, there's many ways that could go. But there must have been occasions where animals were able to use size, body language, sounds as well to say. Do not fight me today. It is not worth the while. It's not worth your time. And my like go-to example in the living world is there's cases where big cats have fought storks and cranes as well. And the big cats don't come out as the winners. You know, like a, a tiger weighs over 200 kilos, a stork might weigh, I don't know, 15 kilos. But it doesn't mean that your tiger is just going to destroy the pointy billed bird. Like, you know, immediately that's not how nature works. And I think what we show is perfectly yeah, reasonable. I think it's a good argument that that you can make. Definitely. Even the smaller animals, you know, when you're fighting for your life, you pull out all the stops. Yeah. Like there's that scene with the Simosuchus when he's he's fighting for his life and he's so much smaller and he figures it out. <laughs> One of the sort of main take homes that you have to have when you're thinking about prehistoric animals is they are not kind of like prototype animals that haven't yet evolved mechanisms for living for doing whatever it is they do. Everything that has lived is 
a functioning part of its ecosystem, right? It's evolved in the context of like knowing how to take shelter, knowing where to find water if it needs it, knowing where to forage food, knowing how to interact with other members of its species. And in a world where you're living with animals bigger and smaller than you, you must have co-evolved with them. And we, of course, this is present in everything today. There's no animal that like doesn't have some response to things that want to eat it or kill it or whatever, because everything has some kind of response. So that must have been the case in prehistoric times as well. And of course, we're never really going to know exactly what the mechanisms, you know, the, what the behaviors, et cetera, were. But we have to infer that if you're a small animal and you get confronted by a big predator, you run away and hide, or you advertise the fact that you're unpleasant to eat, you know, or you do something to deter the predator. So for an animal like Cymosuchus, we didn't just make that behavior up. It actually combines various different behavioral tricks that are seen in vaguely similarly shaped uh, living animals. We looked at behaviors used by various squat bodied lizards and some chunky salamanders. And you have all these like weird, like mouth opening displays and sort of hissy displays and like even sort of clapping their limbs against their bodies and like, look at my arm a bit. You don't want to bite me, that kind of stuff. And yeah, um, again, it's yes, it's speculative, but it's justifiably speculative. It, this must have been present in the world of the age of dinosaurs, especially if you're talking about like a 70 centimeter long crocodilomorph versus like, you know, a big, powerful theropod. They must have had behavioral adaptations like that. Yeah. Yeah. So when the Majungasaurus is trying to eat it and it's making that like clicking, clapping noise, was that it hitting its leg against it itself? Is that what that noise was? Yeah, it's slapping its hind limb against its the base of its tail. Oh. Yeah, which again, you know, the, the idea that animals do sort of unusual percussive sounds, all kinds of things to sort of just, a lot of these behaviors are, they've evolved just to give the predator like a moment of, whoa, 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 yeah. what, the, what, what the hell's going on here? You know, yeah. a couple of seconds of misdirection or distraction can literally save your life if you're a small animal. So yeah. 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 Speaking of small animals, I really liked seeing all the babies. What was the baby velociraptor, the pyroraptor, the uh, Isosaurus? Just so cute. Baby Triceratops <laughs> was back. Oh, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. There's a lot of fun to be had at that point. You know, there's no get away from it. A lot of babies die in prehistoric planet. But there's a number of things that we have deliberately portrayed because, again, they were features of that world. And it, you're missing a trick if you don't get the chance to, to incorporate them. So among the list of things, you know, in some ways, the Lake Cretaceous world is very similar to the modern one, but in other, in other ways, it's unusual. And one of the ways in which most dinosaurs are unusual relative to big animals today is they mostly rely on this strategy of producing huge, huge numbers of babies. So first of all, there's like millions and millions of eggs everywhere, which <laughs> has got to have all kinds of impacts on animal behavior. But then the fact that like every mother produces like, I don't know, 15, 20 eggs or so a clutch, probably several clutches a year. Footprints show us that the populations of lots of dinosaur species mostly are mostly formed of youngsters or babies and juveniles. Well, then, as a you know, an, an obvious consequence of that is that if you're a predator, we don't like this idea. It's like very unpleasant to us. But most predators are going to be baby killers. They're going to be mostly <laughs> finding little juveniles rather than tackling full size adults. So that's a fact of that world, and it would be wrong to. Uh, a <laughs> little bit, a little bit ashamed about it, but yeah, it's <laughs> well. You showed show some babies did survive, and they yeah. There was yeah. always <laughs> like a, a happy ending. It seemed like, like well, here's the one that made it. <laughs> That's right. Well, it's it's like you know people point to sea turtles and frogs that produce you know big flashes of spawn. It's like yeah, there's going to be times when they all die, or when survival is one in a hundred or one in a thousand. That is a fact of that strategy. But yeah, if there's one in a thousand survive and there's millions of these animals, then there's still millions surviving. So it did well for the dinosaurs, non-bird dinosaurs for obviously a long time. It's a very successful strategy, made them nearly indestructible for a long, long time. Yeah. And like with the sauropod, I mean, that the hot seg opteryx going after the baby sauropods <laughs> was very intense. But we talk about on our show too all the time where it's like, a giant adult sauropod, it has nothing to worry about. And that's what they show with the Alamosaurus too. It's basically just like old age is the only thing getting it. So the babies are the yeah. ones to go after. Yeah. Now at various times we have um, discussed the idea of whether we should show something like um, 
big theropods taken on an animal like a sauropod. It doesn't have to be like a sort of, you know, gigantic 50 ton sauropod. It could be like one of only, only the size of an African <laughs> elephant, say. But we're making shows for families to watch. <laughs> <laughs> mm-hmm. And some of these predation events, so yeah, many people have said this, you know, in, in their writings about dinosaurs, it's like some of the predation events would have been deeply unpleasant mm-hmm. to watch. Without going into this in any detail, you know, most of the kills that we see in nature documentaries are censored. You know, they're cut in a certain way, they're edited in a certain way. You don't get to see the, the full, exactly what happens in the event. And for, let's say, an animal like uh, Tyrannosaurus to kill a Triceratops or even a, a, you know, a mid-sized sauropod, there's going to be lots of blood. There's going to there's be lots of like <laughs> removal of tissue. Yeah. Animals, predators do not attack other animals with mercy in mind. They're not trying to put them out of their misery. They're trying to eat them, right? So, you know, predatory birds today, uh, sorry, I've gone down a very dark path here. <laughs> I'll, I'll, I'll say one more thing and then I'll stop. You know, predatory birds today, they'll pin something down and they'll eat it. And at some point it'll die, but they don't kill it and then eat it. What I'm getting at is obviously there are certain res- constraints in how we depict behavior predatory behavior and what kind of predatory behavior we can show. Yeah. So a certain section of our audience is like, why did you show Tyrannosaurus Rex doing a mating display when you could have had it ripping a Triceratops's head off? It's like, well, <laughs> we can't show, we, we can't, not only, not only is it quite yeah, well done, yeah, quite tropey, we can't show the full graphic horrors of some of the predation events that did occur. Makes sense. Yeah, it's not the style. I think it was Hatsiraptors once after the, the Tethyhadros, not the sauropods. Oh, my bad. To... <laughs> <laughs> Thanks for the correction. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah that's right. Yes, yeah, it's, it's Rajasaurus, the Abelisaur that's going for the Isosaurus. So oh, yeah. Babies. The With the events you couldn't depict, too, I was thinking a lot of times we've heard with sauropods, the strategy might have been like bite a chunk out, wait for it to bleed mm-hmm. to death, which, yeah, isn't the kind of thing that it sounds like you want to be yep. depicted. Yeah. Yeah, we spoke about that as well, that specific strategy, which of course, um, yeah, Greg Paul's written about that as inspired by false killer whales with sperm whales. And it's, that's a perfectly viable strategy for, uh, yeah, yeah ex- exploit uh, sauropods in an almost parasitic way. But yeah, you, you, no, no, I'm not going to show that. Not going to show that. Yeah. Yes. I've got uh, an important question Garrett and I have been trying to, to figure out on our own. There's a scene with the Beelzebufo, Bufo, the devil toad. Beelzy Bufo, yeah, yeah. Beelzy Bufo. And right before it, there's that little dinosaur, but we couldn't figure out which dinosaur that was. Could you <laughs> tell us? It's right before the sauropods show up and start doing the mud bath. Yes. There's a little dinosaur. It kind of looks like an ornithopod or something. Oh, I was wondering if it was a baby Mashigasaurus. The only dinosaurs, to my knowledge, in that sequence are there's a Mashikasaurus that's shown drinking at the edge of the pool and it runs away. I think the Beelzebufo lunges at it and runs away. So I think that's what you're you're thinking of. Okay, thank you. Yeah. Okay, vindicate. Mashikasaurus has been like a real education for me actually building that dinosaur because I don't have the opportunity to really kind of responds to some of the things that people have said about season one. But l- let me let me say one thing. <laughs> is some people are like, why didn't you make the teeth more protruding in Mashikasaurus? Well, in reconstructing it, I found I'm pretty convinced that the conventional reconstruction that showed the teeth really like sort of spiraling outwards, like kind of the spokes of a bicycle wheel, it's not right. Oh. I think that the, the lower jaw, the dentary was uh, rotated in the wrong way. And when you correct this, the teeth still look very strange and interesting once the mouth is open, but they don't protrude uh, in the way I think they actually disarticulate the, the lower jaw when reconstructing it in the original couple of uh, technical papers. Our guide on what all of our animals look like is always based on, well, what do we actually think? You know, it's, There's never a push to like, add more teeth and make it look more scary. There's, that's never, I'm under no pressure whatsoever. None of us are to do that. And... Uh, if something ends up looking, oh, that's a bit disappointing. I was hoping it would look weirder. It's like, well, tough, you know, that's, that's what we, that's what we're going to go for. And, um, yeah, it's worked because the, the animals look great. It's oh, just, yeah. there's all these, for every single one of them, there's all these like interesting steps as to how we got to where we did. Yeah, definitely. Awesome. Well, this has been amazing. Yes. I hope it keeps going. I hope there's a third one. Yeah. <laughs> 
<laughs> I can neither confirm nor deny. <laughs> I mean, obviously, you know, season one, hugely successful. Every indication so far that season two, there seems there's a lot of love for it out there so far. I mean, watch this space and fingers crossed. <laughs> and uh, yeah, yeah, let's, uh, yeah. Thanks for everyone's interest and positive comments. Thanks to both of you. Glad you've enjoyed it. Yes. Uh, thank you so much for chatting with us. Yeah, thank you. Thank you very much for having me. Thank you so much, Darren, for chatting with us. We loved hearing all about the details of Prehistoric Planet and for you to, I don't want to say confirm, but, you know, let us hope that there's a series three. <laughs> yeah, third season would be good. And in just a moment, we'll get on to our Dinosaur of the Day, Baptornis. But first, we're going to pause for one last sponsor break. And now on to our Dinosaur of the Day, Baptornis. This one, I will say, is also a bit of a stretch, like last week, because it doesn't appear in Prehistoric Planet, but Hesperornis is in Prehistoric Planet 2. We already covered Hesperornis, as I mentioned, in episode 250, but Baptornis is related to Hesperornis. The Hesperornithiform? Yes. And it also lived in the Western Interior Seaway, like Hesperornis. In the late Cretaceous, too. So it lived in what is now Kansas, which we mentioned at the time was mostly the Western Interior Seaway. It was in the Neobrara Formation. It's also been found in what is now Sweden. <laughs> where, yeah, where the Tergay Strait joined the North Sea. I've never heard of something which has been found in Kansas and Sweden. And between, <laughs> that's a really funny combination. Yep, now you have. <laughs> so Baptornis looked kind of like a penguin, but it had a longer neck and teeth. It was about the size of a loon, and loons are about 28 to 32 inches or 71 to 81 centimeters long, and they weigh about 9 to 12 pounds or 4 to 5 and a half kilograms. Baptornis was good at diving and swimming. It was probably a really great swimmer, but not great at moving on land. Its lower legs were close to its body, and the feet stretched out sideways, so it would have toppled over if it was moving upright. It was in a permanent plie? <laughs> kind of, yeah. <laughs> yeah, well, based on how its lower legs were, it would have pointed its toes forward and waddled or took small hops to move around on land. Baptornis ate fish. There's one specimen that was found with copper lights that are about 0.4 inches or one centimeter in diameter, and they have remains of a fish. <laughs> it's good to know what the diameter of a <laughs> Baptornis poo was. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Glad we have that detail. <laughs> You're welcome. <laughs> Baptornis probably hunted smaller, more mobile prey compared to its relatives that were larger, and it would have held its prey in its beak. Hesper ornithiforms may have been able to hold and turn their prey as they swallowed it headfirst. Hmm. The type species is Baptornis advenus, and the genus name means diving bird. O.C. Marsh found the first fossils in the 1870s and then named Baptornis in 1877. The holotype includes parts of the foot, which probably belong to separate specimens, so now only one of them is the type specimen. It's another... Bone Wars dinosaur, along with Hesperornis. Yeah. It looks like Hesperornis was also Marsh. Mm -hmm. Really seems like Marsh won the Bone Wars. <laughs> no. Depends on how you define one. Named the best dinosaurs from it. Hmm. That is one way to look at it. <laughs> <laughs> now, in 1977, Larry Martin and Orville Bonner wrote about a fragmentary, immature... Baptornis specimen. It included the vertebrae, pelvis, parts of the legs and feet, and parts of the jaw. Other specimens have since been found, many of them juveniles. A young specimen was found in an area that may mean that Baptornis either traveled a long distance from shore or it nested somewhere nearby, like maybe some kind of island. Oh yeah, like we were talking about with the islands. They don't all survive, so <laughs> yeah. it could be hard to know. Many Baptornis specimens are isolated bones. There's only five specimens that have been found that have more than a single bone or element. Though in 2015, Alyssa Bell and Louis Chiappi said that there may be more in museum collections. Baptornis may have migrated based on fossils being found as far south as Kansas and as far north as Canada. And Sweden. Yeah. <laughs> 
<laughs> it lived in a subtropical to temperate climate. And there was a second species of Baptornis, Baptornis varneri, named in 2007 by James Martin and Amanda Cordes Person. But later that one was reclassified as Brodavis, which is another Hesper ornithiform that's about twice the size of Baptornis. I'm glad I'm not the only one who had to say Hesper ornithiform. <laughs> it's a really hard for it to say. It is. <laughs> Now, going back to Sweden, the fossils found in Sweden originally were thought to be a Cretaceous flamingo <laughs> <laughs> called Parascaniornis stentioi, which lived in the late Cretaceous. But later it was found to be Baptornis. They found a vertebra, so it's not enough to compare and know if this is a second Baptornis species. Yeah, you know, a single vertebra can be difficult. Yes. So they found that there wasn't enough to make Parascaniornis its own species, that Cretaceous flamingo, but it's still unclear if this vertebra is a junior synonym of Baptornis. And our fun fact of the day is that there are a lot of different styles of webbing that dinosaurs like Baptornis, Hesperornis, or even Spinosaurus could have had on their feet. <laughs> That's an interesting one. It was such a fun thing to dig into. I really enjoyed it. So starting with the most common and most familiar type of webbed foot, it's the type that ducks have. They're called palmate feet, which is Latin for palm shaped. They do look palm shaped. Yeah. And they're, you know, solid like a palm, I guess. In addition to ducks, it's found on gulls, terns, swans, geese, flamingos, penguins, and a lot of other aquatic birds. The three toes that point forward are entirely webbed on a palmate foot. The webbing runs all the way to the ends of the toes, creating basically a full flipper when the toes are stretched out. And when they swim, what they do is they keep the toes spread out on the power stroke, but on the return stroke, they bring the toes together, sort of like collapse the oar in a way. Mm -hmm. And then there's a lot less drag on the way back. Mm. It's a very efficient way to do it. Something we can't do because our feet are big, floppy, <laughs> immobile objects compared to dinosaur feet. But we can walk better on land than Baptornis. Yeah, that's for sure. There's also a fourth toe in dinosaurs that have palmate feet. It points backwards as a hallux, but if it's a palmate foot, it doesn't connect. The webbing doesn't connect to the others. On ducks, it can be lobed, but that's a, that's a different story. There's also toady palmate feet. That's where the fourth toe is rotated around a little bit and then connected to the other three, which actually adds about 50% more webbing and surface area to the swimming ability. Hmm. Because if you have three toes, you know, you only have the two webbing areas. But if you have four toes and you get three webbing areas, <laughs> a lot of those birds too, and dinosaurs presumably, have longer toes when they're swimming so that they have a big old flipper to use. You can find these toady palmate feet on boobies, cormorants, pelicans, and a few others, but it's much less common than regular palmate feet. There's a lot of regular palmate birds which spend a lot of time on land, like ducks, penguins, and gulls, which is probably why they don't do the extra large flipper of the toady palmate, because you're pretty committed to being in the water most of the time. The Baptorna style of like walking real awkward on land <laughs> if you go that route. Then there's another strategy for the birds that hang out on shores or stand in swamps, but don't necessarily swim very much. And they have what is called semi-palmate feet. That includes plovers, sandpipers, herons, and some others. If the analogy of Spinosaurus being like a wading bird holds true, then maybe they had semi-palmate feet as well. Mm. That's basically just webbing similar to palmate feet, but it doesn't reach the end of the toes. Usually it only goes about halfway down or sometimes much less. So it's essentially equivalent to maybe like a snowshoe, like a small snowshoe, giving some more support on mushy ground. I think it's just like the story you were talking about in Prehistoric Planet with the crew using snowshoes in the swamp. Yeah. It's essentially exactly what heron and these other animals that are hanging out in swamps have built into their feet with the semi-palmate <laughs> webbing. The last type is by far the coolest looking and maybe my favorite, 
but it's also the least functional in most situations. <laughs> That's called lobed feet or <laughs> lobate feet. That's the type of webbing that Hesperornis has in Prehistoric Planet. I think they might have picked it just because it looks so cool. Because if you were guessing based on similar you know, birds, you'd probably give it palmate feet since that's what most of them had. Mm. Each toe on a lobate foot has webbing sticking out around it, but it's not connected to the other toes. And you can also see the joints in the toes too, so they look pretty hilarious, <laughs> like big, wide, flat toes. And for example, on the American coot, which is a very common bird in North America, I've never noticed their feet. We've seen these birds all the time, but they're always sitting in water. I need to see their feet. Their feet are huge and they have these giant goofy lobes on them. It just is delightful. They're also bright yellow. So uh, it's, it's something else. <laughs> I would give the analogy if palmate feet are like wearing huge mittens, lobate feet are kind of like wearing big Mickey Mouse gloves. <laughs> it's just like the individual fingers are just like extra huge and goofy. So... Some ducks do have that lobate hallux, but the birds that have three front toes, which are lobate, include grebes, finfoots, and coots. They're useful for animals that swim more than the semi-palmated waders that are basically just standing in the water, but not as much as the ones that have palmate feet for swimming. Hmm. It's sort of a halfway adaptation to balance walking and swimming ability. A lot of them have a hallux, too, that isn't messed with too much. So I don't know, maybe that it's possible some of them could even perch a little bit or at least use their hallux for some stability on the back of their foot. From the Audubon Society, they said, quote, the palmate toes help a coot push through the water. On land, the lobes fold back when the bird lifts its foot, which facilitates walking on a variety of surfaces like mud, grass, and even ice, end quote. Hmm. Sounds like a pretty good foot to have. It does. If you don't mind looking ridiculous. <laughs> well, if that's the foot you have, I'm sure you don't think it looks ridiculous. <laughs> that's true. I love the American coots. I also saw these videos of the parents of American coots. Apparently, one of the things they're famous for is being super aggressive with their babies. And their babies are bright red, which is really weird. But if one baby steals food from the other one, they'll grab the one that stole the food by the neck and just like shake them. Oh. <laughs> it's ridiculous. I'll share a, a video on our Discord because it's pretty funny. Funny. That's <laughs> <laughs> it turns out that foot webbing evolves pretty easily and has shown up in tons of different semi-aquatic animals and multiple times even in similarly evolved birds. Is it just the kind of thing that you can grow pretty easily? All you need is extra skin. There's a gene that stops skin from forming between digits and fusing the digits together. And if that gene gets suppressed, you can evolve webbed feet apparently pretty quickly. It's even easier than growing the flaps of skin for gliding, which has evolved dozens of times. We talked about that with flying, where flying's only evolved three times in vertebrates, but gliding evolves all the time. I think these webbed feet are like a whole other level of super easy to evolve. So considering how many times it's evolved in modern dinosaurs, it's most likely, I would say, that non-avian dinosaurs that spent a lot of time in the water would have had webbed feet too. I actually think it's way more likely that they had webbed feet than they didn't have webbed feet. Mm. For those dinosaurs that had hands rather than wings, they probably also would have had webbed hands <laughs> because a lot of quadrupedal mammals and amphibians have webbed hands. You just don't see it on birds because they don't have hands. Their wings, you know, have the whole thing going on that they have going on. They don't have any space for webbing. But I think it's possible if you're drawing Spinosaurus and you think it was actually swimming like fully in the water, it should be drawn with both webbed feet and webbed fingers on their hands. Too. That would be interesting. Yeah. Oh, webbing. It's pretty enjoyable. Check out those coots. And on that note, that wraps up this episode of I Know Dino. Thank you for listening. Stay tuned for next week where we wrap up our mini season on Prehistoric Planet 2 and cover episode 5, North America. Lots of dinosaurs in there. And if you want even more dinosaur goodness delivered to your inbox, sign up for our newsletter. You can do that at inodino.com. Thanks again, and until next time. Good day.